You guys want to know a secret? This is the truth to Winter RV. This is Winter RVing 101. Coming to you in Whitefish, Montana. You know, it's uh, just about Christmas time, it's December, and we are learning the hard way about frozen pipes, mold, humidity, and keeping these issues down. What we have found is what everyone thinks is not gonna happen to them. As you can see behind me, I've got the bed pulled apart. The plywood is up and it's out of the rig. The mattress is up, it's out, and it's in the trash. And this is because we had a problem with condensation building on the back wall here. In the winter time, we've got the heater on, we're, we're exhaling a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity is created just from living, and it hits this cold wall, so condensation will form unless you have a dehumidifier or other things in place. And what happened to us here is condensation was building on the wall, we didn't know about it, it was dripping down, I pulled the bed apart, and your worst nightmare, we found mold under the bed, super cringy, so cringy. So we moved into the living room, we quarantined our bedroom, we ordered a new mattress, we tossed everything, and this is the aftermath. We've cleaned it out, we've got rid of the wood. I'm not going back with the plywood. This was covered in plywood, like every RV. Part of the problem is not having that air circulation. Air circulation helps keep it dry. It's kind of hard work. Um, you saw me, hand sign. If you've got power tools, awesome. It's gonna make your job go so much faster. But I'm kind of a budget DIY guy. I got that hand saw for $20 and I'm framing the bed. So what you're looking at here is the new bed frame that I'm putting together, you know, going back to that old school slats. On top of that, I have found this right here. This is called Den Dry. I'll show you this Dendry mat that I've put on top. You know, I think it's primarily used by the sailing community. It's picked up by RVers. I think they might even market it to both now. Looking up closely here. It's this plastic membrane that is very tough. It's very rigid. And if I can get the angle right, you can see it's gonna have the mattress float just about a quarter of an inch above the wood slats here. And this is going to allow air to circulate so as the body heat at night, you know, it creates moisture and it's pulled down through the mattress. And then if your mattress is sitting on plywood, mattress companies will actually invalidate your warranty if you've got mold or moisture under there because they say you're not supposed to have it sit against plywood it's got to be able to breathe my experience is your mattress needs to ventilate you know i thought yeah it's not going to happen to us it will happen to you as it has happened to me and the dehumidifier and this is going to rectify the situation so your ideal humidity should be between 30 to 50 percent. If it gets too high, uh, you start to run into a lot of issues. And it's really important, I can't stress just how important it is to protect your investment of all of your possessions, of your RV, of your health. And this dehumidifier right here, it's got our humidity levels from 70 to 80% down to 30 to 35% all the time. It works automatically, it's got a digital readout, it's quiet, uh, and all you gotta do is dump the water every once in a while. Now this is a 30 quart dehumidifier, uh, which means it removes about 30 quarts of water from the air in a 24 hour period and it has been more than efficient for us. Now, when shopping for dehumidifiers, I looked all over. I know Amazon has those 50, 40, $70 dehumidifiers. The reviews were all over the place and I felt like I just couldn't trust it. This is way too important of an issue to just take a chance. So I went with a Home Depot, bang for your buck. This is a 30 quart, it cost me $160. And at first it was a little noisy, you know, little rattles, little buzzes. I think there's a break in period because after about a week, it got really quiet. This is just how quiet it got. I'll turn it on right now. It 
sounds like you're running a fan. Um, most people, this won't bother you. Some people actually really enjoy the white noise. Now what's really nice is the air that pumps out of the dehumidifier is slightly warm and it does help warm up the room quite a bit. I was not expecting that when I first bought this. And it's actually really nice to have this warm air come out all the time when it's, you know, minus nine, minus 15 degrees outside. So what I have working alongside the dehumidifier, I recommend this. This is called Damp Rid. You can get it at Walmart, you can get it at Target, you can get it at just about any big box store. And what this is, it's moisture absorber. This pulls the moisture out of the air and it has been working great. You can see on the label here, they market this to RVers and boaters, um, and I would not have been able to make it through this winter without having buckets of these around the RV in the places where the dehumidifier could not pull the air. I'm not endorsed by these guys, it just really works. Um, they make it in multiple sizes. This I keep in a small cabinet, the large tub, I keep under the bed and one in our big closet because at the beginning of the season up here in the winter, we found moisture inside the cabinets too. Uh, there was mildew buildup. Where you get mildew buildup, you can get mold. And there's a big difference between black mold and white mold. Um, black mold penetrates the surface. It's very detrimental to your health. White mold is a product of mildew and having way too much moisture. It doesn't penetrate surfaces, so it's very easy to clean up. Having these, plus my dehumidifier that you can hear running in the background right now, 100% worked. We have not had a single issue with too much moisture. We haven't had a single issue with mildew. A large tub of damp rid will cost you about $10. The small tub, I think it's about $5.99. And this thing lasts a couple of months before we had to replace it. Um, they've got a little indicator on the side that tells you when it's getting too full. It's basically just activated charcoal that absorbs the water. And you can hear it, this one's still good to go. Um, but when it gets really heavy, like a bucket of water, you know it's time to get a new one. So keeping the air inside at a comfortable temperature is extremely important for everyone in the wintertime. We learned at the beginning right away just how expensive it is to run these cheap little space heaters. We thought that we were going to be saving money by using a small space heater and when we got our first electric bill it was kind of shocking how much it was. I think how much was the electric bill? Like $150? I think our first electric bill using this 24 seven around the clock was like $150. So that was learning the hard way about those small space heaters. They're also kind of dangerous. I hear from the fire departments all the time warning against using those because they often find them getting clogged with debris. If you don't clean it properly, it will catch fire. I've talked to several full-time winter RVers and the oil filled radiator is the most energy efficient. We used an oil-filled radiator along with our RV furnace. They kind of worked together and we found our energy bill came down substantially, at least by 30 to 40%. You can get these for very cheap and using the oil-filled radiator along with our furnace kept this place extremely warm. It's a personal choice to use Reflectix insulation in your windows here. We did not do that in all of our windows. We found that unnecessary. I did insulation in two windows. In our bedroom, we have a window behind our heads and that was a little cold at night. So I chose to put the insulation in our bedroom window that was at our headboard. And then we have one chair that we sit in that was right next to a window, right up against that window, and that window was cold too. Other than that, not having Reflectix in all the windows still allowed us to bring in daylight and to open them up to get some fresh air through here if it was a nice day out. So here's your frozen pipe solution. This is Reflectix bubble insulation you can get from Home Depot or Lowe's, any kind of do-it center. 
It's used for a lot of different purposes. You're gonna use it as window insulation. You're gonna use it to wrap your pipes, wrap your plumbing. Here's a scrap piece that I used. This was left over from insulating one of my windows. You can see it's very thin, but it does an incredible job. Very high ratings to protect yourself against the cold air outside. What I've done here is taken a plumber's heat tape. It's basically a plugged in cord. Here I'll show you the power cord. I've got this power cord running all the way from my electrical box back there. So this power cord is hooked up to an extension cord, comes back from my electrical box, all the way back here to the pipe that gives me my fresh water coming out of the ground. What that does is this will keep my pipes from freezing in up to minus 40 degrees is what it says on the packaging. So far we have experienced minus nine and this has kept our hose from becoming frozen. This is a budget DIY solution to getting a heated hose. The heated hose I saw on Amazon, you know, for a 25 foot length, which is what this is, this is 25 feet, is I think like $100, $150 in that range. But anyways, this solution here, getting your foam wrap with a little bit of all purpose outdoor duct tape. This is split. This black cord warms up and it will keep my hose warm in the snow. To give you a closer look, this is a scrap piece of the foam that I used to wrap the hose. It's very similar to your pool noodle. You get this in the plumbing aisle at Home Depot. You can get a six foot piece of this. I think it's for like $1.50. Um, they've got different widths, they've got different sizes, but you know, for a hose, this I think was like an inch and a half. And I was able to get, you know, 25 feet of this for really cheap. So I've got the heated cord running all the way up this pipe, across the hinge, and then down all the way up to my rig. Minus nine degrees, it's keeping my hose from being frozen. This solution cost me 55 with the foam included. And that is your budget DIY solution to keeping your hose from getting frozen. Well guys, we made it. It's springtime here in Whitefish, and I'm not frozen, I'm not a popsicle. Everything that I told you about with this rig, so far it's worked, but there's one more thing. So the pipes froze in three separate locations. You have your hose, you can see right behind me, right here, boom, right there. And we've already gone over that. You also have your sewer hose. You can't see mine, because it is right underneath this platform. In extremely cold environments, you do have to worry about a frozen sewer hose. It did not happen to us, but I covered it right away at the very beginning. I'm keeping the hose underneath the RV inside my skirting, and it comes out right here. I built this wood block to cover up the sewer hose because in extreme cold conditions, you can even get ice buildup within your sewer hose. I wanted to avoid that situation. The third place your pipes are gonna freeze are gonna be in your underbelly. If your furnace pumps into your underbelly, you may not have to worry about frozen pipes within the underbelly of the rig. But like a cold bridge where it says ice on bridge, it's because you've got wind whipping underneath that bridge just like wind whipping underneath your RV and it causes things to freeze. Even with underbelly, we had a major problem with pipes freezing underneath of the rig this year. And so I built skirting. Two ways to do your skirting. Uh, you can get foam and you can do wood. Um, I actually found the wood to be a lot cheaper when calculating uh, costs from the local Home Depot. Foam was gonna cost me about $260. I've got an 80 foot perimeter around my rig here. I got away doing a wood skirt for 155, it may have been $160 with the screws. I framed the skirting like this. And then I just screwed the plywood right on top of that. I did that around all 80 feet it took me one long evening. I had a little help from a friend. If my friend wasn't there to help me cut wood, it would have taken me two evenings. Um, it was pretty quick. 
my friend was from Canada, a full-time RVer, and with his experience, he said that the wood skirting will work just fine. It's just a matter of keeping the wind from whipping up underneath the RV so your pipes don't freeze. Now, to cover the gap, I've got that same foam here. They make this foam in many different sizes. So however big your gap is between your wood skirting and your RV, you can get a piece of foam to just wedge in there. Just push it in. This has worked perfectly for me. As soon as I got this up, we no longer had frozen pipes. I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope that my experience from being a full-time RVer is helping you. I'm hoping that some of my tips and tricks uh, might help you come up with your own solutions. These are more of a guideline than a rule, of course, but I found everything that I talked about, they absolutely worked for us. I'm going to try to bring you guys more videos. Like and subscribe. We'll see you again.